Hello everyone, I'm uh, George from Ireland. This is my English Law channel. So um, this video is going to be about um, the separation of powers uh, under the Constitution of the United Kingdom. I know it's about English law, uh, but obviously England um, is the major portion of, of the UK, over 50% of its land area and 83% of its population. And of course, um, England's at all is almost identical to Wales's law. So um, anyway, uh, Eric, Barrent is, is a scholar of jurisprudence, and uh, he said the following about the separation of powers. The separation of powers has been a central concept of modern constitutionalism. Its primary purpose is the prevention of arbitrary government or tyranny which may arise from the concentration of power. So um, uh, it goes back to, to um, Lord Acton's dictum, which, which he wrote in actually in a letter in about 1900, it wasn't intended for publication, that um, power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt, absolutely. So if any branch of government is over mighty, then um, the temptation to abuse its uh, prerogatives will be almost irresistible. So the three branches of government are the legislative, the um, judicial and the executive branches of government. Something that I found recently that just an elected US senator didn't know. The same pertains in the United States. So um, Baron de Montesquieu, this uh, 17th century French philosopher, he's the one who first uh, propounded the principle there ought to be a separation of powers, which there wasn't in France um, at that time. So this is the foundation of constitutionalism. But you must remember that um, well into the 18th century, or into the 19th century, many countries didn't have constitutions. So simply untrammeled monarchical power. There was um, uh, primitive despotism, even if it was despotism éclairé in some countries such as Austria. Um, Aristotle, as I previously said, he said there ought to be the, the separation of powers because some people would be too minded to uh, misuse their powers for nefarious and uh, selfish purposes. So um, anyway, uh, the judiciary, that's judges, the courts, um, has, has, has a special, special role in all this. So people say that legislators make law and um, uh, executives um, apply the law, uh, where um, as the, the uh, judiciary um, um, enforces the law. People sometimes say interprets the law. But uh, do judges make law? That's a contentious debate, which I'll come on to a bit later. So at the core of this is the idea that these um, different different branches have different roles and they must keep to their appointed limits and not um, trespass into the territory of the other one. Um, because if um, uh, too much power was, was concentrated in the hands of one branch, then that uh, it, could, it could be unfair um, or could just make mistakes, honest mistakes. But the mistakes would be very, very big if, uh, if uh, these things were um, unchecked. Um, anyway, so... Uh, Great men are always bad men, are almost always bad men, as as Lord Acton said, because these mighty people, how do they become so powerful? Usually through dishonesty, through um, uh, immorality, illegality, and so forth. So the, the branches are supposed to be a check on each other to make sure that nothing gets too strong. Of course, the downside of this is then decision making is slower, and there can be a, a log jam between them. So uh, anyway. Barber, the legal scholar, said it's efficiency, not liberty, which is the heart of separation of powers. Maybe it just functions better. That's not to do with freedom. And the Lord Chancellor, <clears throat> you go back to about 15 years, he was in all three branches of the government. So these things are not strictly separated. Point out that the cabinet in the United Kingdom, they're all in the legislature. They're usually in the House of Commons or in the House of Lords. There have been a very few exceptions to that um, over the centuries. So... Perhaps the, the, the three branches of government are not that separate in the UK. In the United States, for instance, people in the cabinet, they're not. They're the executive, they're not in the legislature. <clears throat> Although, let's say the vice president can't cast a vote in the Senate if it's equally divided. Um, anyway, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, look, look further into the, the separation of powers here. So there's, how about a total separation of powers? Well, the House of Lords had a committee on the Constitution, and in 2007 they looked into it and produced the following report. They said the constructive relationships between the three arms of government, the executive, legislature, and the judiciary, are essential to the effective maintenance of the Constitution and the rule of law. Well, there, there are legal scholars, Bradley and Ewing, and they disagreed. And they said the complete separation is possible neither in theory nor in practice. Uh, and in the UK, it's not. They're not completely separate. So, um, Look at the Westminster model, as in Westminster is the UK Parliament. Remember, it's the Palace of Westminster, even though no prince or princess has lived there for centuries. Yeah, that is, you can call it the Palace of West, Westminster, the House of Parliament, same thing. That's where the Parliament of the United Kingdom meets. So, um, anyway, 
there's not much of a separation between parliament and government because uh, the cabinet ministers um, are either MPs or their peers. Um, so they have to be in they have to be in parliament. Um, anyway, so the these things are almost united. Um, so some people think that's bad. Should they be separated? Perhaps. So don't vaunt the separation of powers and then not actually separate them. So um, the UK system has evolved uh, gradually and piecemeal without any particular plan. Um, and if you go back to the Middle Ages, a lot of the executive weren't in Parliament at all and Parliament met only fitfully. Um, so the judiciary is more independent than the others and the House of Lords, they used to be used to have law lords in there. But, but these people in the Supreme Court, they do the title Lord, but they're not in the House of Lords anymore. Um, before the Constitutional Reform Act, as I said, Lord Chancellor, he was cabinet minister. He was um, in the House of Lords, so um, in the in the the, the, the legislature, and um, he was the judiciary. Obviously, he was a judge as well. So the House of the Lord Chancellor he used to um, act as Speaker of the House of Lords. So they didn't actually have that title Speaker, as in saying, "It's your turn to speak. It's your turn to speak. No, you're not allowed to speak," and so on. Um, he was the most senior judge in England and Wales. Um, and indeed, he would sit on, on very important cases. And it, he was also a cabinet minister. And there was a time when um, the Lord Chancellor, um, Derry Irvin, who was a, a Labour man, he um, sent out a letter asking barristers to donate to the Labour Party. And he was also in charge of who was going to be appointed to the bench, become a judge. Now, there was a blatant conflict of interest here. But anyway, that anomaly has since been uh, rectified. But uh, so... Um, He's what happened after 2005, the Constitutional Reform Act. The Lord Chancellor isn't there in the House of Lords, despite the word Lord being there. The uh, the House of Lords has its own speaker, who's got the title Lord Speaker, and um, the Lord Chancellor is, is not a judge anymore. Um, he's Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State of Justice, although a woman has held that role. So that's a sort of double title, Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice. So the, the office of Lord Chancellor goes back to, to the um, 11th century, to Anglo-Saxon times. Um, so um, he doesn't have the same powers of patronage he did. Um, there are various committees that look into various things. His judicial, um, uh, his judicial appointments function is gone, dealing with uh, complaints and discipline. Um, there's the Lord Chief Justice largely handles, handles that. So there's a Judicial Appointments Commission, as in to um, pick judges for, for courts. And the Lord Chancellor, um, he does have some role in that, he or she, but he doesn't have the always complete say he had before. So um, the Lord Chancellor, yes, is a cabinet minister and usually in the House of Commons these days. But it's, it's, it's no longer a judicial figure, really. So the Constitutional Reform yeah. Act um, was an astonishing um, innovation, uh, partly because of the Human Rights Act of 1998, which took effect in 2000. And um, people felt that the, that the UK was behind on this, uh, didn't properly separate the three branches of government. So um, according to the European Convention on Human Rights, it was unlawful for um, the legislature and judiciary to overlap so much. So there was a case at McGonnell and the United Kingdom in 2000, and the European Court of Human Rights said that the fact that um, the uh, uh, judiciary, the executive and the legislature were almost fused in some cases was unlawful. Um, for example, the bailiff of Guernsey um, was um, in fundamental breach of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Guernsey is an island close to France, but it's not part of France. It's a crown dependency. It depends on the, on the United Kingdom. You may have heard of the Channel Isles, Jersey, oh, sorry, Guernsey, Jersey, Sark, and I can't remember the other one, Alderney. And we often call them the Channel Isles. That's certainly a geographical expression. It's not a political entity. They're all separate. They all have their own states, meaning legislature. They're all in direct relationship with the United Kingdom. They're reliant upon the UK for foreign affairs and defence. They don't have their own armies. They don't have their own embassies. They're internally self-governing. That's by the by. So the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 um, uh, implemented some major changes in terms of entrenched separation of powers. As I said, in relation to the, to the um, Lord Chancellor, and it led uh, to the Supreme Court being set up, Supreme Court meeting, um, not in not in Parliament, but across the road um, in this former London County Council building, was it? Um, it used to be a court, uh, it used to be a sort of magistrate's court across Parliament Square. And it was thought the physical separation um, was significant and people would realise it's not part of Parliament anymore. So um, previously, the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, which handled these um, handled uh, law cases, because in the old days, you'll hear the House of Lords decided blah, blah, blah about law. And I, when I was little, 
I used to think, what does that mean? Like the hereditary peers had a vote. No, it may only meant the judges. And actually judges weren't the House of Lords forever. They were only in the late 19th century they got into the, they got into, um, uh, the House of Lords. Um, okay, so let's look at uh, the legislature and the judiciary. So the question is, um, uh, do do judges make laws or not? I would submit they do. Should they? Well, that's a moot point. So um, uh, there's common law, uh, often meaning the laws which are created by judges that they have to handle cases. There's also a statutory law, as in statutes which are passed by Parliament or other legislatures, such as Scottish Parliament, Northern Ireland Assembly, county councils, and so forth. Um, there are ways that the statutes have to be interpreted, and statutory interpretation is another topic that we'll come on to later on. So um, uh, judges claim that they can find new laws, or so they just invent them. Um, and we'll deal with that as well. As well, It's also a bone of contention. There was a well-known case, R. Evans, an attorney general, 2015, which went to the Supreme Court. And it was about Section 53 of the Freedom of Information Act, which was passed in 2000. There were some letters between um, Prince Charles and the government, the black spider letters to do with his writing a black pen and his spidery handwriting, demanding this and that and achieving them and um, urging them to implement certain policies or pleading with them to thwart other ones. Could this be kept um, uh, secret or not? But uh, the, the point about this case is um, there was um, a statute that the court, statute that the court had to interpret and they said they interpreted it in a way which um, <laughs> guarded the fundamental common law rights. Um, and in, in that doing so, they limited the power of the executive, the attorney general, because the government was minded to keep this secret. They didn't want to disclose this correspondence. It would be highly disobliging to his royal highness. But anyway, people said there's a public right to know. If he's lobbying government ministers to do this or not to do that, we want to know. Do we approve or disapprove? It, it affects us. So... Um, so it was until 2009 that um, those very senior judges, the Lords of Appeal and Ordinary, um, were in, in the House of Lords and even had the right to vote on legislation, though in reality that they seldom did so by 2009. So they're not, not in the House of Lords anymore, despite the title Lord. <clears throat> so um, there was a case called Jackson, and it was to do with the Hunting with Dogs Act. And so... Um, uh, so Lord Scott and Lord Hoffman were judges who wanted to sit in this case, but they had to recuse themselves, as in remove themselves from, from the case, since they had um, voted in favour of this act um, when it was before Parliament. Or <clears throat> even if they voted against, they should still recuse themselves because they have an interest. It goes back to Lord Hewitt's dictum of 1924. Justice must not only be done, it must be indubitably and manifestly be seen to be done because the, these law lords... They voted this way or that on that case. And it's possible, possible that they could still have an open mind listening to this case, be unprejudiced, deal with it in a fair way. But even if they did do so in a completely unbiased manner, it wouldn't look good. People would still accuse them of partiality. So to maintain the reputation of the judiciary, they decided they would not hear that case. They, they would let their colleagues do so. Um, anyway. So we'll look at some statutory uh, limitations. Um, so uh, there's the House of Commons Disqualification Act 1975 um, and the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 say that um, full-time um, judges are not permitted to be members of parliament or peers. Members of parliament and peers cannot be judges as well. Now that's full-time judges. You can be a recorder, part-time judge. Um, Cherie Blair, that's Tony Blair's wife, or Miss Booth, as she is as a barrister, she was a recorder. They're magistrates. Um, who are just um, ordinary members of the public, respectable citizens who volunteer unpaid to deal with low low level criminal cases. They can be M MPs. Otherwise, some public spirited people would be would be unable to enter public life, and that'd be wrong. So um, the uh, Lord Chancellor he used to chair the debate in in the um, House of Lords, and he no longer does so. So there's another thing to bear in mind. That's the uh, sub judice rule or sub judice, whichever way you want to pronounce it. These Latin words is probably judice in in actual Latin, but you know, got in, when it, Latin was turning into Italian, pronounced more judice, whatever or whatever way you want to say it. So it, it says that um, MPs should not debate um, uh, cases which are um, in court at the moment or which are going to come to court quite soon. Okay, so um, how do they uphold this? Because uh, there's the House of Commons standing order which says um, the Speaker 
or the chair may direct a member who breaches the rule of the term sub judice uh, resolution in the House to resume his seat, as in no sit down, you're not allowed to speak. Okay? Um, so to try and cut them off because they could prejudice cases. Oh, the jury heard him say this or that, and that made them want to vote guilty or not guilty or something like that, or even civil cases. Uh, they mustn't, they mustn't say anything like that. So let's have a look at the uh, executive and the judiciary. So um, there, there's a, a duty by statute of the ministers have to maintain the independence of, of uh, the ju judiciary. So the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 says they have a there's a particular duty of the Lord ha Chancellor to uphold the continued independence of the judiciary. So judges are not to be taking sides. They've got to make rulings. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. The people are going to be happy, others are going to be elated. Whatever you do, you're going to take some flack. So the judiciary mustn't let that bother them. You're racist towards this group or towards that group. You're racist against whites or ethnic minorities. You're prejudiced against men or against women or against hetero people or against gays or against the rich or against the poor or against... Someone's going to lose. And so somebody can always accuse you of that. And you've got to do it without fear, without favour, not let that bother you. Make the right decision. Even if it looks bad, even if it's very easy to force you, accuse you of being unfair, because the, the loser is always going to say you're unfair. Um, so uh, there's the Constitutional Convention, which says that judges don't participate in party politics um, and judges don't speak out on political matters. No, that's not a law. It's a convention. I was speaking to a judge about this years ago and he said, no, it's not prohibited. Having said that, I don't know any who are politically active, even, even members of political parties. They're not specifically prohibited. Should they be banned from doing so? Maybe. Because what if someone then started to join a party and then got actively campaigning? Would we remove that person? Could we legally remove that person? Pressions to resign? What if they refuse to resign? You see, perhaps we should deal with this situation rather than allowing the, the possibility of it arising. But on the other hand, perhaps we'd be depriving them of their rights over much. And then a lot otherwise gifted people wouldn't join the judiciary or people who've got something to contribute in politics wouldn't go into politics because they weren't allowed to. So that might be um, unfair might be an awful pity. So the one of the purposes of the, the um, uh, judges is to be a check on the executive. So to hold them to account the single judicial review where, where governmental decisions can be put before courts to, to assess their legality. So um, the executive and the legislature overlap in the Westminster model. It's in the UK way of doing things. And it's a model that was exported to many Commonwealth countries. So many erstwhile British colonies follow a similar system. So um, in the wake of the Constitutional Reform Act, the United Kingdom still has a system where the parliamentary executive of a parliamentary executive. And that's because the um, executive, as in the prime minister, cabinet ministers, they are held to account by the legislature. They go there to be questioned by the, their own party, the governing party, by the opposition parties. So um, we can scrutinize them. Um, so the opposition have a, have a um, critical analysis role pointing out the mistakes, the failings, the dishonesties of, of the uh, government of the day. So um, the various mechanisms through which this is done, there's Prime Minister's Questions, which is half an hour on Wednesday, and there are many debates and many special committees on particular matters. Special committees are quite small, 10 or 20 MPs. There's a chair of the special committee who's not necessarily from the governing party, and the political composition, party political composition, um, is roughly reflective of the strength of the uh, respective parties in the House of Commons. So um, the executive depends on the, the confidence the House of Commons to continue. There's a motion of no confidence that can be kicked out. The last time that happened was um, April 1978, the fall of James Callaghan's Labour government. Well, there was an election in which Labour lost. Anyway, so uh, what should you, you should know various new words about this. Uh, so that's um, enough about uh, the separation of powers. Toodaloo.